Hello friends, today we are going to take the poem Easter 1960, the analysis of the poem. It is written by W.B. Yeats. Now, William Butler Yeats was born in 1865 uh, and he was uh, born and brought up in Dublin. He is considered Anglo-Irish, descending from English Protestant settlers. He is considered one of the greatest poets and visionaries of the Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. He had a lifelong interest in mysticism, spiritualism, occultism, and astrology. As we can see in all his poems, we find symbols you know, from these sciences, occult sciences, astrological and historical symbols are found in his poetry. Now, he was the founder of Irish literary mo movement and the Abbey Theatre. He is also known as the Great Founder. Yeats had a very long poetic career starting in the late 19th century and successfully stretched through the first half of the 20th century till 1939. Now, W.B. Yeats's Easter 1960 is all about a historical event called the Easter Uprising, which happened in Ireland on Easter of 1916. Basically, the British promised the Irish that they would give them free rule over their country in 1914. But then the World War I broke out and the English totally backed uh, down on their promise uh, because they wanted Ireland's help in fighting the World War I. So some of the Irish folk didn't want to wait around for the war to end. So they decided for a rebellion and they wanted the control of the country on their own. Uh, English were not happy with this and they brutally put down the uprising and executed a bunch of the uprising leaders. Some of these leaders were good friends of W.B. Yeats. So Yeats was not happy either. And this made him express his anguish in writing a poem about it. Now, the Easter 1916 is named uh, after Easter 1916 because it is about Easter uprising of 1916. And he, uh, specifically named it as Easter 1916 and not the Easter Uprising to mark it as an important event in the history. And uh, finally, Easter 1916 reminds us of Jesus Christ who also sacrificed himself for humanity's sins and he was resurrected on Easter. Now, if you look at the form and rhythm of the poem, the stanzas are of irregular line and length. They are a mix of uh, trimeter and iambic trimeter and tetrameter. Uh, this fixes to show the ambiguity in uh, Yeats's mind because he was not too pro for the rebellion and on the other hand he was very sad for the execution of his friends. Now stanzas 1 and 3 are divided into 16 lines representing both the year 1916 and the 16 men who were executed after the Easter Rising. The stanzas uh, are also scenic in character invoking the landscape of Dublin and the surrounding Irish countryside. The stanzas second and the fourth are about specific people here Yeats names uh, them and these are tw there are 24 lines in stanzas 2 and 4 symbolizing the fateful day of the month april 24th when the easter 1916 rebellion began and here's a newspaper clipping from easter 1916 we can see how sin sin uh, led the rebellion in ireland now if we look at the stanza 1 of easter 1916 it's it's uh, it's about the revolutionaries uh, like how they lived they worked and it's how dublin is known for the 18th century houses and here it remembers how he and the rebels exchanged uh, some small talk in the club and uh, how he how he was acquainted to all the you know, people involved in the rebellion Towards the end of the stanza, Yeats introduces the subtle but powerful metaphor of mottling. 
Now to wear motley is to wear different colors combined. The people of Dublin could be said to be a motley group in 1916 because they were Catholic and Protestant. They were Irish in spirit, but English in terms of citizenship. Poor and rich both took part in the uprising. And the stanza ends with the refrain that will mark all the stanzas of the poem. The oxymoron, a terrible beauty is born. Now, if the fact poem is known mm, for the famous refrain, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. The Easter Rising was terrible because of its violence and loss of life, but the beauty was there in the dream of independence, of being horse, of romantic imagination. As we go to the second stanza, Yeats introduces the, uh, like he inter, um, names the um, leaders, the social roles of the rebels. And one of the um, historical figures he remembers is Constance Marquis, who was a um, very dear friend of Yeats. And she is known to have designed the citizen army uniform. He states that she was sweeter before arguing for Irish independence. She used to ride horses and hunt rabbits. But then she got involved by a, her husband in the rising. Yeats also speak, uh, speaks on Patrick Pierce, a poet, and another leader of the uprising. He mentions that this man as riding our winged horse. This is a reference to the Pegasus, which represented poets in Greek mythology. The other who Yates mentioned next is Thomas McDonough. He was also a poet but was executed before he could write anything lasting. Yates hoped that this young man would become a great name in literature. Next Yates moves to John McBride and he is described as the drunken vainglorious Laos or Hick. McBride was married to Morgan whom Yeats was deeply in love with and that's why he mentions that he had done wrong to uh, some people who were very dear to his heart and uh, although he clearly hates this person but he states that now he must add him to the narrative as he too died fighting for a great cause. Now the term casual comedy um, he refers is may refer to the idea of doubling being a stage as uh, it is a famous line from as you like it by William Shakespeare, all the worlds are stage and all the men and women are merely pairs. In 19th century, domestic comedies were plays about ordinary middle class life and family concerns. Yates and McBride had been fighting for the love of Maud Gawn and whom he had adored. But McBride married her. So this stanza is all about the description of uh, the leaders of the rebellion then this is the scene like how terrible the beauty was that it, everything changed and changed utterly so this picture clearly depicts how Ireland was changed after this then we move on to stanza uh, 3 this introduces the extended pastoral metaphor the rebels have hardened their hearts against the English and they have focused on one purpose. So they had become like a stone, stone in the spring where everything moves around it, but it doesn't move. It is at this point that he changes his tone towards the rebels. They are garnering a respect they didn't have before. In order to empathize the unchanging nature of the rebels, Yeats goes through a variety of images. He speaks on um, rating briefs and the tumbling clouds. And these are the things which do change, but the rebels, they did not change. Then, this is the final stanza, where Yeats asks a significant question about the rising and the subsequent execution. Like, was it needless death after all? Was it all worth? Did the rebels feel so much love for their country and they were willing to sacrifice their lives? And what good is Ireland if the dreamers are dead? He is just saying that all the people who wanted Ireland to be free, they are not there to see. The immediate political issue that rises 
is that England was on the verge of granting Ireland status as an independent or free state, which would allow it to have its own parliament. Now, the granting of independence had been set aside during World War I, and that's why um, the English required Irish support for the war. Now, in the second stanza, Yeats introduced the idea of the song. In the stanza, before he developed the idea more fully, like in Irish political ballad tradition, naming the names of the marches was important. So, Yeats uh, now names them like Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and John McBride. He also includes James Connolly at this point, the labor leader. And uh, here, he Yates also refers to the green as the traditional color associated with Ireland, the Emerald Isle. And it's also the color of the original Irish flag. Now, at the end of Easter 1916, Yates reconciles himself to the fact that whenever green is worn, people will remember the sacrifices of the rebels of Easter 1916. Now, after reflecting um, on the rebels' constancy of purpose, as if their hearts were enchanted to a stone, the poet wonders whether the rebellion was worth it. And the poem ends on the note, of ambivalence and futility, reflecting Yeats's own reluctance to engage in political debate. So Yeats uh, was very clear in his thought that he was not pro-rebellion, but then he wanted to commemorate the you know, people who sacrificed their uh, life for the freedom of Ireland. So that's the end for the Easter uprising a moment the poem Easter 1916 written on it. Friends, if you like uh, the explanation, please like and share and subscribe to the video. Thank you.